Hey guys, welcome back, Schizo and Series. I'm just here on my Windows system, trying to debloat it, get rid of all the unused applications, all the wasted utilities, all the telemetry. I left one thing, that's the shutdown button, we'll use that right now. Basically, I managed to get the entire OS under 4K, pretty good, in case Bill Gates was right. Um, what else did we do recently? We got some, oh here, this is a 3D model of a Boeing 727 with some passenger information about who was on the plane and where they were at this particular time. Who cares about that? Not me. Oh, also, by the way, you can move that around the screen. Sorry, didn't mention that. You can kind of zoom in and out, pan left and right, the whole nine. Um, what else do we got here? We got some, some sample text, pretty nice, cool stuff there. And then we got, uh, obviously, you have to have somewhere to talk to God, and uh, we have that. Looking for some meaning here. MSG. Hmm. No Chinese food today. IE. Okay, I got rid of that on our Windows install. Anything else? Nothing right now, but pretty cool stuff all around. Um, so topic today, obviously, is going to be rendering text to the screen, rendering fonts to the screen. And uh, it's pretty simple, to be honest. Pretty short video today. So have you ever thought about how you would rasterize a character? I don't care about how other people have done it. This is about how you would do it. And as far as I can tell, you only have to think about one thing and that's knowing where the pixels have to end up in your image or on the screen. And uh, then you put them there and that's it. So for this letter M, you'd have to know that there's maybe the, the pixel array would start here and you have to know, hey, by the way, one pixel to the right of that, you have to draw that pixel a certain color. You know, how would you go about storing that information and doing that? Think about it. It's pretty interesting to think about how you would do that. A couple of different ways that I've thought of to do that, and I'm sure that there's many more than just this. Um, option A, which I'm pretty sure is what is used most of the time, and that is you have a predefined rasterization for every letter in every desired font size. So let's say you have this M in this font size, and then you have a slightly bigger M, and then even smaller M, you might store different rasterization levels of that letter and then just pull from the one that you need at that given time. So that would be fast to draw because you'd have all the pixels already kind of stored. Just be copying them from somewhere else onto your image, maybe changing the color, but it would be fast to draw, but it would take up more memory because you have to keep storing all these different font sizes for every single letter that you want to use. Option B might be pretty cool. That's gonna be a some kind of vector graphic representation. So maybe you would store, instead of these pixels, you might store four lines. One, two, three, four. And then you just re-render those lines based off wherever you are. It might get harder for letters like, I don't know, like G or like, you know, a K or something. How do you draw that? I guess this could be lines. This would be like a circle and a and a curve. I don't know how you do that. But you could potentially figure out a way to store a vector format for every letter, and then just rasterize it every time you have to. Of course, that would be very scalable. You could increase the font size infinitely, but it would be slow to draw, obviously. Option C, which is what we're doing in this video, that's storing each character minimally, and then getting the pixels, the rasterization that you need at runtime. And so basically, I'm gonna store an eight by eight pixel array for every character and then just draw, like, iterate through the rows and columns of this letter at runtime <laughs> and figure out where I have to draw pixels. That's gonna be very efficient for us memory-wise, easy to implement, but it's also gonna be slow to draw, obviously. And perhaps the best implementation might be a combination of A and C. Maybe you'd figure out, hey, I'm gonna, well, maybe you'd store everything like I was saying with a a minimal array, but then you'd figure out, hey, when your program starts running, you'd figure, hey, I'm gonna use these three font sizes and these 10 letters. I'm going to just pre-compute these sizes. So if I happen to use a size 8M five times, I don't have to constantly be reevaluating this entire array. I can just evaluate it once and then just copy and paste that chunk of pixels as needed. So that could be the best way to do things. 
Um, maybe not, I don't know, up to you. Why don't you give it a try yourself? So how did I do this? Basically, you can see here from ASCII values 32 to 126, I've implemented a eight byte quad word for every single character. So for space, obviously it's all zeros. There's no pixels on for space. Exclamation point, you can see here I have a couple of pixels turned on. So basically the idea is you iterate through these eight byte data type things uh, and you just draw a pixel wherever you have a one. And then if you have a different font size, you could have integer scales of this. So for example, if you get to this one, a font size one would be, hey, just one one. But if I had font size three, that would be a three by three array of ones. And every zero would be a three by three array of zeros, basically. And so basically you can just compute these characters and their pixel representation in real time. Okay. So what's the algorithm for a full string? So we use, you know, because we're not normies, we use null terminated strings. So every string ends in a zero byte. So you begin at the first ASCII character of your string, and then you figure out which eight byte array that would correspond to. Let's say it, you passed in a number 32, well, that's gonna be space. So you're just gonna draw a space. A space is just nothing, but you can kind of see how that would work. Now, if that eight byte array is a normal letter, you're just gonna draw it and then go to the next character after moving right by that amount on the screen. Now, if that character that you came across was a bogus character, let's say it was a number bigger than 126, well then you have to figure out how you're gonna handle that. You could skip it, you could put a space, you could put a question mark, you could put some kind of cool graphic, whatever you wanna do, you could do that. Um, what if that character happened to be a new line? Well. Here you can say I'm saying go down to the left. That would basically mean if you have a, a string like this, you print your letters across, you get, get to your new line character, and then go back to the beginning, but down one font size, essentially. So that would work for that. And then if you get to the null byte, you stop. That's it, very simple. Now to the code. It's gonna be a pretty quick overview, a very simple implementation. Let's just show you how this works. So we'll start off in example A, and I'll show you what we have going on here for our includes. So the two most important includes for what we're doing in this video are gonna be this set text uh, file, as well as our assembly listing. Let me open up those two files and show you what's going on really quick. Um, Um, what else? I think the, just the font will do as well. Okay, so the font you saw before, that's just gonna be basically a listing of every single possible character. Here you can see is X, for example, W, V, Y, Z, all the, the symbols you would need, all in order of the ASCII value. Uh, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, obviously all that is in here, that's all stored in order, and of course, you can change this. If I wanted to change the way exhibition point looked, I could make it thicker. I could change these zeros to ones, right? I could make it a thicker character. That would also be an option. I'm not gonna do that, but you could. You could make other fonts as well, but the way it's set up currently is that only set only accepts eight by eight fonts, but you could add your own fonts to this very easily. Then we have our set text function. This only has one dependency, which is the set pixel function. It's gonna draw pixels on the screen. So how does this work? Basically, it says it renders a, a string that you pass in the start address of at a certain location with a certain font size and font and color. So pretty straightforward. You can see basically what it does is it loops through all the letters in your string, checks for new lines, unknown characters, like I mentioned to you before, um, then it just basically loops through the rows and columns and it uh, loops through the scale size. So if you scale the font up to a different font size, it will scale up how much pixels it's gonna draw for every one it encounters in these arrays. So that's how it works. It's very straightforward. Um, now to the actual code that it's running for our, let me show you the example. Um, 
for this sample text. Let's show you how this is implemented. So you kind of can see here, it's very simple. We initialize our frame buffer as we did before. Here you can see I'm setting the background to blue. This is the RGB value for blue. Um, so these three bytes, R, G, B, that's 0, 0, 0, 0, F, F. This is the alpha level, the transparency, which is not even used, I'm pretty sure. And then this one indicates that our rendering is upside down because the frame buffer is an image that's basically upside down. Usually you count images from the bottom in bitmaps. Frame buffer is from the top. So that one means we're upside down. That's all it means. Um, you can see here is that call to set text. I'm passing in, again, information related to the font color, the font size, location, and the frame buffer itself. Um, and here is the sample text. So you can see that I've encoded the straight up ASCII bytes, it's DB. And I have all the characters for each line, followed by a new line. And if you want, I could add, and you know, the null bytes at the very end, I could add some bogus character here. Let's add some character that's not in our array. Let's do 199. If I run this now, let's see what it puts there. It puts this unknown character, a little cross. I put a little cross there for to indicate basically this character is not supported by this font. So we have this unknown symbol that goes in that place. Um, next example here, it's this alphabet screensaver thing. Again, all it is doing is drawing a bunch of random rectangles to the screen, random colors, as well as random font size, color, letters, capital letters. So you can kind of figure how this would work. Let's check out the code. Um, again, it includes our very minimal. We just have those set text and schizone uh, listings. Also, we have here, because you can tell that we're drawing rectangles, we have the set filled rectangle function, as well as um, random number generating functions from our previous episode. So it starts with a black screen, has an infinite loop here. Um, we flush the screen contents to the frame buffer, or I should say frame buffer contents to the screen. Um, we pick some random locations for our rectangles, random dimensions for the rectangles and the, and the random colors for the text and the rectangles, and we plot them to the screen um, in a very simple way. See the same thing here, just the set text function call to draw the text. Only caveat here is that you can see I'm, I have a, a buffer for the characters. So you can see this number buffer, should really say letter buffer, but basically it's two bytes. Um, the first byte is the one that we're going to randomize. And the second byte is the null byte that ends the string. So that, that way, let me run this program, you can see it plots one letter at a time to the screen. They're all like null terminated, single character, but two byte arrays essentially. So very cool. Um, what else do we have? Example C. Now this one was kind of weird. This one's the one that has the 3D model. So you can see that we are, we have our text being drawn to the screen at a certain location. And that location is computed based off it's 3D position. So there's a 3D position in space that we're basically orthogonally projecting onto the view plane. Like this pixel here at the top left of each bit of text, that's where both that line is connected, but also the font is actually being drawn, the, the text. And so, yeah, it's pretty cool. No matter how you rotate the model, the text is always going to be on the screen at that position in space. It's always oriented the right way. This is kind of reminiscent of if you're an engineer and you know MBD, this is kind of how some of these things are rendered if you do uh, MBD instead of drawings. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, whatever. How does that work? I won't get into too much detail on this. The code's all available. You can check out the code if you'd like. Um, oh, wow, debugging stuff. Let's get rid of that. So we have our cursor implemented here, but the most important thing is just our, our uh, implementation of the actual text. And so if you recall from our previous video, we talked about 3D rendering. We had these structures for the perspective, but also for the geometry and uh, and everything else that goes along with that. So here I, add, I had to add a couple things. One, all those leader lines that go from the text to the model, those have to have their own edge structure. So just like the plane 
add its own edge structure. I can show you down here. Here's all the plane pixels and stuff and edge combinations. So too do those lines have to have their own. Of course, they're very simple. They're only one combination, one set of pixel, one set of vertices per line. So you can see here the text edges um, structure is just two quad words long. But um, yeah, that's how that works. Then we also have all the text. So we have to have a new structure for text. Basically, instead of encoding like the vertices and the edges that we had to do for our line segment renderings, for text, we have to encode the text location. So here we're passing in a pointer to the 24 byte position, so X, Y, Z location in space, as well as the actual string itself, address of that, the font and the font size. So if you can, if you want, I can change the font size of one of those particular renderings. Let's change this one, for example. Rerun the code. You can see we increase the font size of the plane type on the string. So that's pretty cool. Besides that, the whole operation of this program is the same as it was in our previous episode. It's the same plane model and everything else. So that's pretty cool. And the last thing is our simple GUI. Now this one, if you remember from the beginning of the video, this is just this kind of bogus Windows implementation. Actually behind me, there's nothing um, that you can even see. I, I can even show you here. There's nothing, oh, there's, no, there's no clock or anything. Um, it's just a very simple blue screen with the gray bar on the bottom. Um, it detects where the mouse is. If the mouse is over the start menu and you click start, you know, nowhere else does it work, but if you click on the start menu, it'll pop up. Click anywhere else, it goes away, you know, um, and then obviously the shutdown button, if you click on that, it turns off. So this is just an exercise in, in minutia, <laughs> in, in tedium. If you look into the code, it's all just basically drawing a bunch of crap on the screen and checking where your mouse is at all times. Um, it's not all that interesting, but it does show that you can kind of create a GUI with everything that we've talked about so far. You have the ability to draw text and draw rectangles and circles and lines and polygons and stuff. You can detect the mouse position, detect clicks. You can make a functioning GUI um, that does interesting stuff. So with that out of the way, I'll end the video. If you made it this far, check out our Discord server. Um, if not, I'll see you in the next video. Have a nice day.